We are excited to be having this academic paper series event looking at the purge of Jong Sung Tech and North Korea's evolving SEC's strategy along its border with China. With the rise of China and the difficulties other countries have had dealing with North Korea, China-North Korea relations have been a main focus in Northeast Asia. China's economic and political support, along with North Korea's ability to defy the international community, makes China-North Korea relations something that needs to be constantly tracked and analyzed. The purge of Jong Sung Tech, Kim Jong Un's uncle and one of the longtime top leaders in North Korea, who, has, who had been seen as an important interlocutor with China, raised new questions about ensuing North Korea-China ties. So KEI is excited to welcome Dr. Adam Cathcart to talk to us today about China-North Korea relations. His paper and his analysis provide some interesting ideas for us to ponder about the future of Chinese and North Korean cooperation, especially in special economic zones and relations after Jong Sung Tech. Dr. Adam Cathcart is a lecturer in Chinese history at the University of Leeds. He is also the founder and editor of the website SinoNK, which is a great resource. He is also a must follow on Twitter. He has written for and has been interviewed by many media outlets. And before he came to the University of Leeds, Dr. Cathcart has taught at Queen's University in Belfast, Northern Ireland, Pacific Lutheran University in Tacoma, Washington, and Hiram College in Ohio. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Adam Cathcart. Thanks, Adam. Thank you, Nicholas, for that very nice welcome. Um, I wanted to uh, acknowledge you and the work of KEI just for getting me here. It's been a wonderful welcome. Uh, it's a very robust institution, obviously, and uh, it's an honor not to be asked, uh, only to be asked, but actually doing the work uh, to do this paper. Um, I feel it's you have set a very high standard here, and, and it's, uh, it's something I really uh, am, am pleased to have been asked to participate in, and I hope that it's useful for all of you as well. Um, I wanted to acknowledge uh, two co-authors, uh, Roger Cavazos and Nathan Beauchamp Mustafaga, who's here, uh, the latter, uh, one of the authors. Uh, in fact, there may be a paragraph or text or two uh, in this paper that came from a, a Peninsula post we did for Troy uh, and the uh, Peninsula blog for KEI. So I appreciate the, the assistance on the research. Uh, Charles Krauss uh, at the Wilson Center also uh, got me interested in Sinwiju and, and has um, played an important role in my understanding of kind of, of that. Of, of the of the north northwestern part of Korea, um, and then finally, uh, some of my colleagues at Sino NK, uh, the website uh, that Nicholas mentioned, uh, have helped me with uh, kind of getting Korean sources, doing some of the translation of some of these long slog uh, Chinese articles about uh, about the about the region, about the special economic zones in particular, um, and I think Chinese sources are. Uh, strangely often neglected uh, in our understanding of North Korea, and it's been part of my mission and our mission at SinoNK to bring more of those sources uh, to light. So I wanted to thank them uh, for their work in that regard. Let's see. Whoops. I'm a little fast. Okay. Um, I should add, uh, do feel free to uh, uh, to send me notes about anything, even if you're not a fan. It's always good to hear criticism. Some people feel more more comfortable writing it. Uh, and on Twitter, uh, I think I made a hashtag uh, for this uh, talk, and that's NKSEZ. Should be pretty easy to remember, North Korean Special Economic Zone. So if you're tweeting this talk, which is, of course, fine, um, NKSEZ is the, the hashtag. Oops. All right. Uh, on December 13th, uh, 2013, uh, an academic uh, woke up somewhere in Liaoning province uh, to some very shocking news out of North Korea, uh, the execution of Kim Jong-un's uncle, Jang sung Uh The news might not be particularly shocking at that moment for a Chinese analyst. After all, uh, it had been about a week since uh, news had sort of filtered out that Jang was in trouble. Uh, and that uh, punishments would be forthcoming. Uh, being stripped of his party membership, being purged from the party, uh, these were things that everyone, uh, many people in China had expected. Even the execution, uh, which shocked many people here, um, certainly in South Korea uh, and in England, where I, uh, where I was at the time, uh, very, w it was a shocking moment for, for many analysts. 
Chinese analysts kind of expected it in many ways. There was uh, uh, Zhang Liangui and others had mentioned the, the death penalty may be forthcoming. And of course, from a political cultural standpoint, uh, in China, uh, the execution of an official uh, is not necessarily uh, a shocking event. Uh, you remember the purge uh, of, uh, of Bo Xilai the year before, someone who had actually been involved in, in, in the, the North Korea relationship uh, when he was uh, in Dalian, uh, being a good example, not of an executed official, but of, of harsh punishment. So the culture of kind of legalism uh, is something that may not have been so shocking uh, for Chinese analysts. Now, the one at Chinese analyst named Lu Chao, who woke up that morning uh, somewhere in Liaoning province, somehow that day he made his way to Dandong. Maybe he just happened to be in Dandong on the day of the execution uh, news coming out. Perhaps he received a phone call from his colleagues in Beijing who said, you better get over to Dandong. And soon his work, and he arrived here at the Friendship Bridge uh, in, uh, in Dandong, looking through to Sinuiju, this wonderful kind of... Uh, ever, ever uh, decreasing and, and very interesting and focusing uh, point in the distance there at the other end, uh, Sinuiju, North Pyongan province. And he effectively uh, helped to write a dispatch for the Huanchu Shirbao, the, the uh, Global Times, uh, the Chinese version, widely read foreign affairs periodical. Some would call it a tabloid. Uh, some would call it very nationalistic. Um, but it's very important. And the message there and the headline was that Sino-North Korean trade continues as normal. As normal. Right, each year, Jungchang. Right, it's just completely normal. Everything's fine. Um, talked about the uh, Huanggumpyeon Island uh, special economic zone. The precise same language uh, was used. All continues as normal. I want to ask a few questions. Um, why does Lu go? Why do they send him in the first place? It's interesting that they send kind of a high, high-powered North Korea academic straight to the border and that he's got to provide news from, from the site itself. Um, secondly, uh, what does normal even mean uh, in this context? Uh, what is the meaning of normal in a very abnormal uh, trade relationship? Uh, what does it mean in the abnormality of, of, of national division, the, 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 the division of the peninsula? What does normal mean in the case of a special economic zone where very little has actually happened? And a lot, lot of balloons have been filled, uh, a lot of trade fairs have been held, where almost no construction other than a Chinese-financed bridge has been put up. What does, what does normal mean? What is Zheng Chang? Right? How do, how, do we, how do we define normality? It's a very interesting question. Um, the third question I have is why did North Korea consent to having China finance 2.2 billion US dollars, a bridge stretching from uh, Liaoning province uh, and into North Pyongyang province, uh, just near these special economic zones? Uh, at 2.2 billion. And why does North Korea not build a road that connects to the bridge? And there are not, I'm not going to spend a lot of time in this talk kind of walking you through Google Earth because everybody has their own, you have a lot of time to do that and I hope you'll do it. Uh, spend some time kind of puttering around on Google Earth and look around. You can have a look at this bridge. You don't need to be an expert, obviously, to open the website. Um, and it's absolutely fascinating. The, it's, it's, uh, there's no road connecting to it. And the North Koreans have actually spent more, more resources building a wall around the bridge, literally. The, the terminus of the bridge, there's a giant wall around the construction site than they have doing basic things like um, dam protection, right? Uh, uh, flood protection and things of that nature. So is that normal? Is that what normal means? Uh, finally, uh, why would North Korea not want to develop this special economic zone? Why is normal so depressing? Why is normal... Uh, not uh, a state of dynamic growth when you have a waiting and willing investor, and a very active investor, uh, on the Chinese side of the border, particularly when that, that, uh, that investor uh, represents a long-time and a long-term ally. Or are we, uh, maybe the goal is not to develop it at all. Perhaps the, the North Korean, maybe we need to have a different framework, a different perspective of looking at this. Maybe the North Korean goal is not to develop this region precisely and is to keep the Chinese waiting and to kind of, you know, you keep changing the rules of the game, move the goalposts. And fi uh, my subsequent to that, and who's making the decisions uh, in Pyongyang, right? And is, does this all reflect some kind of confusion uh, within the North Korean leadership about where to go? So the status quo means don't develop it at all because it's too painful and it would make us make hard choices and we'd have to have debates that we don't want to have. Um, the presentation that follows uh, is based 
I just want to be very uh, clear about it. You can obviously have a look at the footnotes in the work. Um, but I do a kind of a standard reading of the normal North Korean open source documentation. Um, I do try to be historically grounded. I am a historian. And so uh, you may hear some today about Sinwiju in 1945. Who cares? I think the North Koreans care. And I think it's, uh, it's, it's important, actually. That also, ha that having a historically grounded view of the Chinese-North Korean relationship, and specifically in this region, uh, helps us figure out, again, that question of normality and continuity versus rupture. I think that's absolutely critical in the way we look at North Korea, is does this represent change? If so, how? Uh, what, is, what is the status quo? And, and what I'll argue uh, at the very end is that uh, if we come back to a more dynamic mode of exchange along that frontier, that's, that's the old normal. Things used to be that way. There was a very dynamic exchange between North Pyongan and, and Liaoning province. And there is, uh, there, there is a precedent for this sort of thing, uh, it's to set up a, a kind of a, a more dynamic economic relationship on the frontier. Uh, the work is based on field work. I do try to make it there fairly regularly um, to the whole North Korean uh, Chinese border region. I was there for the entire month of April, uh, thanks to the Academy of Korean Studies. Um, and finally, the translations from Chinese materials, uh, which I've already mentioned. So news reports, foreign ministry documents, um, until they close the archive, uh, that's extremely helpful for the historical uh, work. And you're welcome to, to uh, if you can't find a PDF of something that I've published, again, bother me by email. I'm, I'm uh, happy to be bothered in those, uh, in, those in those requests. And then public security. And there's a lot of very interesting um, information that comes out of Chinese Weibo. Every public security office now kind of has a Weibo feed. Um, I didn't deluge you with, with citations, and I'm constantly working on collating that stuff. Um, if anybody's fluent in Mandarin and wants to just do that full time for fun, let me know. Uh, the outline of the talk, uh, and, I, and I, would, I will try to be uh, sparing in my, my reading of actual text from the paper. I find that that can, that can make these kind of presentations awfully tedious. Um, so I'll try to kind of talk around the paper, uh, give a brief history of the region, talk about the island itself and its connection to Jiang Sung Tech, which is an interesting narrative that I think many of you are probably generally familiar with, try to bring up a few points that, that may be lesser known. And then finally, uh, in the third will be the shortest part of the paper, uh, questions about North Korean leadership and the SEC strategy. What is the, what's, what's the purpose of what's going on here? And conclude with some larger questions about uh, what does this mean for the overall border region? Um, is Sinwiju unique? Uh, is it simply that the North Koreans are happy to develop Rasan um, and to move ahead in a more quick quick way there because it's farther away, it's less dangerous, etc. Um, or are there kind of laws that we can draw and about Chinese-North Korean cooperation? If things are going badly in Sinwiju, um, is the whole project doomed, right? Okay, talking about the region, this is a wonderful photograph um, of a new uh, Chinese uh, high-speed uh, bridge that is, uh, that this happens to be up near uh, uh, up near the city of two men. So I'm going to talk, move on here um, and give you a map of the North Pyongan uh, province there, which you see in red. And thanks to colleagues at Map Hill for the, for the image. When we look at, at North Pyongan province uh, in, and its role in North Korean uh, history and its role in connections with China, I think we have to predate the DPRK. Uh, it's very, very interesting, the city of Weiju uh, back in the Choson era uh, was, the, was the main hub for Chinese-Korean interactions. Uh, you had uh, a lot of diplomats going through the city. They would take time and stay in the city. So envoys from Seoul or Kaesong would kind of come up, spend some time, spend a lot of money. Uh, there was a lot of movement back and forth uh, down and over the Yalu River. Uh, in that era. It was not as uh, considered as, as strange or an outlier a province as North Hamgyong province in the extreme northeast, right? There were some uh, strange characters in North Pyongan province and it was considered certainly not the center, um, but it's, it's kind of a traditional hub for Chinese-Korean exchange of uh, ideas, people, diplomats, etc. So again, this is, I think this is an important um, moment of continuity. In the colonial era, uh, Sinwiju got built up larger. Uh, which is a, a city slightly closer to the, uh, slightly west on the, uh, down the Yalu River, a little closer to the sea, down the Yalu Estuary, and it was built up. And of course, you have the bridge, which I showed you earlier, which is built on a Japanese colonial structure. So again, I'm going to show you a photo later of the bridge, 
right? The new bridge that's being constructed. And, uh, you know, is this, uh, this, is this a game changer, right? A massive bridge being built into North Korea. Can you see the PLA tanks going straight over it? You know, do we all need to buy apartments in Xincheongchu so that we can have North Korean lorry watch? We can set up a new website to constant, you know, have a constant stream uh, watching the bridge. What's coming over it? Any of those, any of those Chinese uh, lumber carriers that we like to suddenly show up in, in parades? Are those going to be coming over the bridge? Does the PLA go over the bridge if there's a problem in Sinwiju? That's all very sexy and very fun to, to think about. Um, but think about logistically, the most of North Korean Chinese trade is going over a bridge that was built in the 1910s, right? That's antiquated. Uh, where I'm born up in the, 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 uh, the very, very strange and exotic uh, Minnesota, Wisconsin border region, uh, we've got old bridges up there and uh, they're, they're still working on, 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 on building new ones, right? You gotta have, you've got to have infrastructure to have a decent relationship. So I, maybe we shouldn't all sort of think game changer. It's a new bridge. You're updating infrastructure from the 1910s. And again, if you go up and down the border region and you go to little places like Haesan, right, or across from Haesan, the city of Changbai, strongly recommend it. It's worth a trip. It's not something you should only read about in Daily NK. You can do it. Um, have a look. Um, you know, it's all Japanese infrastructure up there. That kind of escaped the bombing of the Korean War. They're still using it and updating it and in, in all kinds of ways. Uh, the Japanese colonial infrastructure, you can learn a lot from the Choson government central reports about kind of how things work in the North, north and Northwest. Um, I should add that the, the, the rail ties to Sinwiju are very, very good, right? The problem with Sinwiju, and I think this is very important for us as we think about does a special economic zone act as kind of a spur to regional development, right? Kind of, the, kind of the Chinese sense, right? You set up Shenzhen and suddenly Guangdong province kind of, it all feeds in and it kind of, there's, there's a dynamic interaction back and forth. The problem with Sinwiju is there are very few lateral uh, communication lines. There are ve there's not a lot of population to the north and east of Sinwiju. The city of Kangye is not connected very well at all to Sinwiju, right? And that comes from the Japanese era because North Korea is still using Japanese era infrastructure. In the 1930s, you didn't even have a train line to Kangye, all right? Uh, so there's this notion of kind of Sinwiju as a spur to kind of n movement that goes east. You're not going to see it. A uh, couple more points about the history and then, and then I will move on. Uh, Sinwiju is also kind of a dangerous place from the North Korean leadership standpoint, and I'll come back to this at the end. Um, Kim, Kim Jong-il uh, is a historian. Uh, he, he knows his father's history. Um, his father had a lot of experiences. And the first on-site inspection, these famous inspections that we all take pleasure in reading about in Nodong Shinmun and seeing Kim Jong-il, I'm sorry, Kim Jong-un look at things, etc. The very first one happened in Sinwiju. Uh, in late November 1945, after a student rebellion, this is the one moment of rebellion and resistance that we can really document in the early history of the North, of the North Korean state, of the proto-state, under Soviet occupation. And that was a big deal. Uh, Kim Jong-il still talks about it in the 1980s. We're going to have another Sinwiju incident on our hands. So this is not some neutral place, right? It's a place that's also potentially dangerous. You have people coming over the border. Uh, more recently, you have traders moving across who are giving information to outlets like New Focus International, Daily NK. Uh, they'll even talk to people like Barbara Demick, um, and they'll even talk to people like me occasionally. Um, and so there's that, there's this uh, kind of sense that Sinwiju is a place that's an aperture, and it's a funnel, and it's potentially dangerous. And you had a student revolt, and, you know, 20 odd students were shot um, in, in the city in 1945. This was kind of a revolt. It's the, it's the closest thing North Korea has to a Hungarian uprising of 1956. Uh, and, and that's remembered. And there's a very stern statue of Kim Il sung uh, in the city square there in Sinwiju, uh, looking, looking, uh, looking tough. Uh, in the 1950s, you had movement of Chinese People's Volunteers through uh, Sinwiju, and of course you had Chinese troops in the, in the, in the area until 1958. So again, this notion of kind of connect connectivity is one I want to I impress upon you. Finally, on the historical side, 1991, in the extreme northeast of the Korean Peninsula, you have the agreement uh, to set up the special economic, or special economic zone in Rasson, right? This, this notion of kind of the greater too many initiative is set up and you start to get these wonderful pamphlets about maybe you should invest in Rasson and they look very similar to the pamphlets now. Things haven't changed so much. You've got a Chinese casino and things like that. Um, but Kim Il-sung, and this is very important, which Kim agrees to what? And which, uh, whose legacy are we following? Uh, Kim Il-sung agrees to that, uh, to that occurrence. Um, but he does, there is no twin 
right? They're not also setting up special economic zones in Sinwiju. Kim Il-sung's view of this entire province is what? It is a granary. It is an arms manufacturing place. It's where you store arms. Uh, you might even make chemical weapons. Um, it's a rear area. And this is guerrilla thinking, right? If we read uh, Adrian Buzo's work, um, if, we, if we look at Dae Suk Su, if we're reading uh, Chung Shik Lee, uh, who has a great new biography of, uh, of uh, Park Chung Hee even, that looks kind of at the Manchurian experience. All of, our, all of our historical readings of this and of Kim Il-sung are that he's extremely conservative when it comes to North Pyongan province. It's a, it's a defense area. Um, although he did allow Chinese comrades in and out during the Chinese Civil War. Let's move on and talk about Huang Kimpun itself. Um, and in terms of language that I'll use, uh, Huang Kimpun is the major island uh, along the Chinese frontier that has yet to be developed. And uh, it, it, Huihua is a much smaller island that's a little closer to the city of Dandong, um, and it's kind of a subsidiary. Huihua, I think their plans are kind of to do agricultural, organic agriculture. There are fewer plans to kind of set up major factories there. Uh, many of you are familiar with the history of how a special economic zone was sort of talked about and then ultimately the plug was pulled in 2002. Kim Jong-il uh, finally uh, agreed that a Chinese businessman would set up a special economic zone. Uh, you can read about it in the book by Paul French, uh, North Korea. I think it's The Paranoid State is his new one not to be confused with the first book about North Korean paranoia by Paul French. Um, but there's a lot of very interesting information that's come out about that connection. Uh, and I think that's important. This is a Kim Jong-il's open to this idea. This is something that he's personally kind of put his imprimatur on. So if you're Kim Jong-un, which legacy are you following? If you love Kim Jong-il, maybe special economic zones in that area are something you can, you can stand upon and say, yeah, you know, there's a legacy here. The, the, the dear leader agreed to this. Um, if you're following the Kim Il-sung line, Absolutely not. Uh, you, you won't set up a special economic zone in that region if you're thinking about legacy. And I strongly recommend the work of Rudiger Frank, who writes about this. Some people find it esoteric. I think it's extremely vital. Um, which, which legacy are you following? So Kim Jong-il put his imprimatur uh, on, on, the, on the area and said, maybe we can set it up. There were massive plans. Uh, the plug was pulled when the, the Chinese uh, investor was found to be extremely corrupt, uh, tax evasion and all the rest. Uh, China didn't want to let it go. Lack of consultation. Right, so this is, a, this is a theme that we see. North Korea kind of waiting, waiting, waiting. Suddenly we've got big plans, you know, write the checks, we're ready to do this. Uh, major change is afoot. And, uh, and China said, wait a minute, you know, this is a bit like the Korean War. You know, you, we had basic agreement on principles and then suddenly you're, you're hitting us with a, with a whole new idea. Um, and that was the, one of the problems with 2002. But you're basically talking about Kim Jong-il being comfortable with extraterritoriality, uh, leasing out Sinwiju, foreign currency, right? There's a, a very, very pregnant topic uh, in, the, in the border region, right? This is a very, very serious topic. Chinese scholars are writing about uh, UNization of the Korean, of, of the northern part of Korea as this is the key. You know, this is what's going to get us in the door. Um, it's already happening. We're, we're achieving influence in that region through UNization. And Kim Jong-il agrees in 2002 uh, to using foreign currency, etc., kind of passport-free things. So that's part of the legacy. Um, the main uh, movement, I'll come back to that bridge in a moment. Uh, the main movement, though, is this man, Wen Jiaobao, on the right, uh, in 2009, uh, who goes to Pyongyang in the aftermath of the nuclear test that May. Uh, others have written a lot more about this than I have. Uh, people like Scott Snyder, you want to make sure to read his work and look at kind of what, is, is this a game-changing moment? If you want to look at um, the infrastructural movement of Chinese-North Korean relations, 2009 is a really, really important year. And I think we still have to unpack what happened in 2009 uh, because uh, what kind of agreements were weighed, what, what is Wen Jiabao pushing for. Uh, basically, this is kind of the equivalent of the Chinese Marshall Plan. Some people have said it's a huge amount of money, right? We're basically going to finance all of this. And they agreed, North Korea agreed in principle, to set up these special economic zones along, across from Dandong. Uh, and, of course, ultimately in 2011, uh, Jiang Song Tech uh, is involved. And I'll, I will refer you to the paper to look more kind of at the history of this. It's important to note. Uh, Zhang is not 
uh, as the Atchison phrase goes, present at the creation, right? We have no idea, you know, kind of, was this the guy who wrote up the boundaries of the economic zones? In 2009, he was still a somewhat shadowy figure. You know, he gets into, the, uh, he's kind of, he's elevated in April of that year. But it seems unlikely that sort of he's behind the scenes in 2009 making all of this happen. He's not named the chair of this important committee until 2011. And so there's, there's rapid movement uh, after that point. But Wen Jiabao's trip in 2009 is, is, a, very, very, uh, is a very, very important one. Um, referring to the paper now, on page, if you look on page five, uh, for instance, um, one of the things that I think it's very important to note are that there's a very, very detailed plan. And this is one of the few very explicit agreements where we see sort of point by point agreement about the way things are going to work. You have a joint committee. China worked very hard and the North Koreans agreed that this was not about one person. This was about committees. This was about institutionalization. You can only talk about helping the North Korean Chinese relationship from generation to generation if it goes beyond one person. And so this idea that uh, Jiang kind of hijacked the entire process, the whole Chinese point of view is that that should not be possible. Right? You have a committee, there are multiple people on the committee. If you read your KCNA this morning, you'll find that two members of that committee are still around in North Pyongan province. The chair of the Communist Party, um, sorry, of the Workers' Party uh, in Sinwiju, the chair of, um, of North Pyongan province, right, uh, of the party committee, uh, is still, he, they're still around. They just went to a, a what was it, St not the Moronbung Band, the State Merited Choruses had a wonderful concert in Sinwiju just yesterday. And these two guys showed up and they're there on the committee. Um, I'll talk about this at the very end as well. There are other members of that committee who are still around. So this human infrastructure is there. Even though the Chinese complain, it's, you know, things have become destabilized with Jiang. We need to find new interlocutors. The whole point of the committee being set up is that that wasn't supposed to happen and it should not be happening. So is that all smoke and mirrors? We're not exactly sure. Uh, the reason I want to refer you also to page five is that you have a lot of very interesting Chinese uh, documentation on uh, problems with the zone, and particularly 2012. Got another image here of, uh, of Jiang Sung Tech with a Chinese commerce minister. Um, major event uh, that August, and uh, I was in China kind of chasing Jiang around. Uh, these, these things came out kind of the next day. I, I was, I think, a day and a half behind him. I sort of bounced around. Um, couldn't get that interview with Jiang Song Tech, sorry. Um, but in any event, uh, this was a really, really big moment. And if you look on the, on the North Korean side of that, of that photo, some of these people are still around. Uh, and I think that's important. But complaints had started to emerge already at the time of this, uh, at the time of this major uh, event. This is, I think, the third, uh, the third committee meeting. And, and this, this committee's got a, an obscenely long title. Uh, and the Chinese press, I think, is very important to follow. So you have official statements, but then you've got uh, major Chinese economic journals basically leaking complaints, right? There's kind of a steady leaking of complaints uh, in the Chinese economic press. And they talked about... Uh, a lot of these agreements have not been basically solidified. North Korea hasn't agreed to do this or that. Flood control, uh, as I'll mention, uh, it was a very, very important element uh, in, in the North Korean preparations that hasn't really been followed up upon. Uh, and so China's not complaining that you haven't started building these factories, but essentially what they are doing is saying uh, the, the preparation for factories that will be built eventually is, uh, is, is, not, is not adequate. Uh, and they talked about uh, the questions of uh, an innovative model of international cooperation that still means much work, thought and human talent, right? North Korea is not allowing enough sort of young, uh, young Turks uh, into the conversation, and Chinese investors are not wanting to put their money in. Uh, the one thing that I'll remind you of, uh, 2012, in, in that summer, a lot of information came out about a Chinese company called Xiyang, or Haicheng, um, that had basically not just been bilked of, of money by the North Koreans, but the North Koreans, this was the biggest Chinese investment in, uh, in the DPRK, and they were basically kicked out by force uh, on, as it turns out, Leap Day 2012, a very important day in, in U.S. DPRK relations. And at that moment, they basically, you know, the North Koreans came in, smashed the windows of where the Chinese uh, advisors for this factory were living, and basically deported them through Sinwiju. Um, the Haicheng hai company, or, or Xiang, sort of kept it quiet for a while, and then ultimately they just put out this sort of bombshell of a blog post um, on their company website that said, uh, 
the North Koreans changed the currency that we were dealing with. All the agreements were in U.S. dollars, and suddenly they said, no, this agreement is in euros. You're changing it tomorrow. That doesn't bode well from a legal standpoint, obviously. Um, they talked about charging them for water usage at a very, very high rate. Um, they talked about um, North Koreans being very, very obstreperous when they came to, to the Chinese uh, headquarters and demanding prostitutes and things like that. And so it was a, a major, major bombshell. And that occurred in the middle of all this as well. So Jiang Song Tech has a lot to do in August 2012. He's meeting, and I'll, I'll show you that beautiful face. I know everybody wants to hug Wen Jiabao. He's a beautiful person. Um, also has a lot of influence. Um, but uh, Wen talked to Jiang very directly and basically said, you've got to follow the rules, right? And uh, there's agreement to all of these things. Uh, he also meets Hu Jintao. So this is this kind of going back and looking at what are they talking about? These special economic zones are very important in Jiang Song Tech's trip to China in August 2012 and those bilateral, not just the big meeting, right, but also these face-to-face -face with both Wen Jiabao uh, and, um, and uh, Hu Jintao. And so this is important, right? Now China wants to say today, nah, not a big deal. Everything's normal, right? We can still invest. You guys, we can still invest in you. You want to change the setup a little bit. Maybe it's not such a big deal. But in fact, I think people at the very top uh, have every right to be uh, somewhat upset that, that these uh, agreements are being, uh, are being questioned uh, by North Korean colleagues. Um, fast forward to 2013, uh, when Jiang is killed. And I'm going to come back to this map. One of the things that the Chinese did, uh, and I've just got about five minutes left here, uh, and then I hope we can move on to Q&A. Uh, one of the things that the Chinese did, uh, and the paper deals with this extensively, is as soon as Jiang, uh, Jiang was executed, basically the next day, they agreed to do a new special economic zone. Uh, or th they agreed that the North Koreans would set up a new special economic zone in Onsong, which is in the extreme northeast, uh, even farther north than Rasson, right? Um, and again, as the paper talks about November, about two weeks before Jiang's uh, purge, North Korea agreed, uh, they basically put out uh, the, uh, the special uh, presidium, said we're doing a whole new raft of special economic zones, and many of them are along the frontier, okay? And so if I can use my laser pointer here, um, we've got new special, we're setting up a whole new one around Sinwiju, okay? Totally different land mass, right? Totally different. And Curtis Melvin has, has shown this. Check out North Korea Economy Watch. Um, it's all to the, to the east. It's nowhere near the, 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 the new special economic zone, the Huang Pyun, right? They're basically, they've moved, we're, we're moving the goalposts and we're, we're, we're setting up our own economic development zone here, North Korean sovereignty. We're going to set another one up at Manpo. And I was just there in April. Nothing has happened. Right? But they've set it up. And you've got school children down at the river collecting rocks so that they can fix roads uh, in the frontier region. I don't know if that counts. But we've set one up there. Right? Uh, we've got other one up here at Haesan in Changbai, right? which is a very important uh, point there, not so far from Mount Pektu. You often hear about, about drug trafficking and human trafficking, prostitution, things like that. Um, China set up a, a very nice free trade zone right across the river uh, from the Kim Il-sung statue. So North Korea is basically saying, all of that really doesn't matter. We're setting up new, new economic development zones. How does China respond? China has spent, if you are a careful reader of the Chinese press, you'll know ever since, and even before Kim Jong-il came to power, Kim Jong-un came to power, they've been pressing for seeing any sign they can of market activity in North Korea, right? Uh, Southern Weekend Daily, front page article picture of the Kim, Kim Il-sung statue and saying market activity in the shadow of the Kim Il-sung statue, right? It's happening. Marketization, yuanization, North Korea is going the direction we want it to. So here, November 2013, North Korea sets up a whole raft of new economic zones, some along the Chinese frontier. What is the Chinese official response? Almost nothing. No commentary. They simply carried this very quietly. Um, this has been announced. What the hell? Okay, this was this is there's no sign of any coordination of this new activity. It's literally on the Chinese doorstep. Only then, when Jiang Song Tech is killed, does China say, "Yeah, this one in the extreme north, uh, Onsung. Yeah, sure, that's kind of near two men. Yeah, we can do that. We, you know, we'll 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 set up a little tourism." And this news about, oh, new tourism, China, North Korea is really opening up to China, the, the, the new tourist zones. You're talking about one train a week with about 40 people, one car full of luggage, okay? One train a week, 
right? That's, this is not a game changer, right? Wow. Uh, you can shut that down tomorrow and, and the impact would be minimal. But China has to agree, and I think it's a loss of face uh, for the PRC to basically say, oh yeah, sure, these new special economic zones, we can, we can roll with that, we can work with you. And I think in Sinuiju, um, you're, you're going to see uh, more discussion about this in the future. There's a lot of big plans for that Huangyunpun Island special economic zone, but because there's a Chinese lease, because of the text in the execution document for Jiangsung Tech, um, you see, uh, you're going to see a lot of questions um, about it. And let me just conclude, here's that bridge, by the way. That picture is courtesy of the Chinese uh, embassy in Pyongyang. Always nice when they get a chance to go to Sinuiju when they're sort of let out of the box. Uh, who's, who's, who's running all of this? What happens? Recall that after the purge of Ri Yongho, General Ri Yongho, in uh, summer of 2012, I happened to be in China at the time, that was front page news, major spreads, and even regional newspapers. And the Chinese line on that was that now that he's gone, we can, maybe North Korea is liberalizing, maybe an opening up, maybe he was the conservative influence that, we, that was so baneful to us. Zhang Liangui, big editorial, again, in the Global Times. You know, this is, the, the barrier perhaps has been removed. You're not seeing that same kind of discussion about Jiang Song Tech in China. You're seeing open sort of belly aching, people very upset, Zhang Liangui again, being, being a, form, uh, a foremost voice. We've translated a, a very long interview with Zhang Liangui on the Sino NK website, which I, I would strongly recommend that you have a look at, kind of goes through his sort of granular thinking about what has happened, where is this relationship going, um, and who's in charge. Uh, and again, I, I want to just, this is a picture, by the way, of Kim Jong-un uh, having just met Li Keqiang, who was in uh, London last week, uh, a couple days ago. And uh, Kim Jong-un was uh, introduced, I think, as... Uh, as a reformer uh, in some ways in the Chinese media, that's what China wants him to be. Um, but the question is, if, if Jiang Song Tech is out of the way, Jiang Song Tech has been killed, Kim Jong-un, regardless of what you think of how much power he's got, his name is on that, so he's signed off. They're not executing Jiang Song Tech without Kim Jong-un's at least formal imperator, right? And the fact that uh, in this moment, he's basically not only agreed to have Jiang ousted in this way, um, he's agreed in this, in this execution document, which is rather incoherent, um, to have him blamed for all number of things, but particularly these, the special economic zones with China being at issue. Not only that, but if you read the Chinese version of the document, he's also accused of helping defections over the Chinese-North Korean border, right? This, uh, was it Pan Bian, something like that, um, that he's accused of, of uh, participating in. So if Kim Jong-un is, is all about that, and then he's allowing this new special economic zone strategy to go forward, um, what does that mean? Is North Korea just bought itself a lot of time? And the Chinese, are, you know, presumably they'll always be there. You're, they're still going to open the checkbooks. Um, perhaps, um, you know, if these new economic development zones, which, again, if you go eyeball them, nothing is happening. It's, it's, these are pieces of paper. Um, North Korea is talking about a new, special e a new economic development zone across from a tourist spot just east of Dandong. And what are you talking about? Oh, we might set up some organic agriculture. People can come down and experience North Korean culture. There's very little infrastructure there, right? That is qualitatively different than a massive seafood processing plant. Uh, it's, ma it's qualitatively different than a software uh, factory like you might see in Dalian in the Special Economic Zone, where if you go today to the Dalian Special Economic Zone and talk to people at Kim Jong-il's visit, they'll laugh, right? This, doesn't, this hasn't resulted in anything yet. And I think that um, the question for us is as we look at it, which Kim are you following? How does North Korea's legacy policy... <laughs> ...on all of this? Can we support China in doing that? Can we say, yeah, you know, go ahead. We want, we want this to succeed. China's been fa fairly uh, active, at least in its media, of saying the Kaesong thing needs to, needs to go well, right? We want that to go well. We want investors to be able to invest in DPRK. Um, to have sort of a common front on that, on that side. Um, and then, uh, finally, when it comes to Jiang Song Tech, maybe, on the one hand, we cannot forget what has happened. Um, on the other hand, if China is willing to basically say, as they did in the case of Onsung, okay, you've changed the rules, we're not going to develop Huang Gumpyun, go for it with your economic development zones, yes, you've rebooted. We've lost two or three years of work here. Um, our investors are still kind of here, <laughs> ready to go. You haven't absolutely alienated everybody. Um, 
perhaps that's that's the, the best answer we have at this point is to say, all right, you've got a new economic development strategy. There's a person in Vancouver working on it. You're talking to foreign experts. You haven't closed Kaesong. Um, maybe this is the best that we get. And it's going to take, you know, Kim Jong-un and his, uh, the people around him another three, four, five, six, ten, you know, 30 years to get it together um, in terms of how they attract foreign direct investment. Um, and China's playing the long game. You know, they've been there. They will be there. Um, this is a setback. Um, I think it's an affront to China, uh, what has happened with the Huang Jinping Island uh, Special Economic Zone. But I think ultimately the imperatives of, of uh, neighborliness, of the need for economic development in the Northeast, uh, ultimately kind of a unification strategy, you've got to build that infrastructure. And China's doing uh, a lot of work along that frontier. Uh, again, if you're up there, up and down the frontier, building whole new cities effectively outside of Dandong, uh, outside of Yanji. Um, they're, they're, they're setting it up, the, the new high-speed train network, it's all there. And to the extent that North Korea is scared by that, it's too bad um, because China's playing the long game. And I think uh, they're certainly preparing uh, in ways that uh, bear continuing to watch. Thank you very much. We will come back to that. Thank you so much, Dr. Cathcart. Uh, we have a couple microphones here on the side, so if you have a question, please. Uh, state your name and organization and uh, ask a good question for us here. Uh, yes, please start us off. Good morning. Uh, thank you for coming, Dr. Cathcart. Um, it was a really informative speech, and I've learned a lot from you over the years. Um, my name is Mike Bassett. I've been an independent contractor for some years, working on um, unification and engagement projects. Um, I have a master's in public diplomacy. Um, my main question um, in the Kim Jong-un era, like yours, is whose legacy is he following? Um, the recent book, um, articles and book by John Jin Sung have been very revealing. Um, so, one of them actually claimed that John Sung Tech was in charge of the OGD after Kim Jong Il died. Um, and for those of you who don't know, the Organization and Guidance Department is in charge of most of the policy and propaganda in North Korea. Um, when I was studying in South Korea, um, Dae suk -soo, who you mentioned, taught me um, that the most important thing to remember about North Korea is that um, survival of the regime is number one on their priority list. Um, so to me, this question of whose legacy are they following is more of a question of um, not necessarily who's in charge of the country, but what ideology are they following? Um, and it seems as if everything that we've seen over the past decades, um, especially because of Kim Jong-il, who, yes, he was a historian, but also he was a master propagandist, being in charge of the OGD for so long. Um, is everything that they show us exactly what they want us to see? Is this very public purging of Jong Sung Tech um, more of a m mortaring for the throne? Um, and is the OGD actually in charge of things? And um, Kim Jong Un uh, is just a puppet or a figurehead like John Jin Sung claims. Thank you very much. Sure. See what you think. Well, I mean, I, I like the, the public diplomacy thing that you're engaged in, and I think that's really important. And uh, in this, uh, just to kind of go in that direction for just a moment before I comment on the others, um, there there are there have been kind of operatic movement across the, the Sea of Blood ensemble, the trade fair, which I didn't even have time to mention, which now it'll be their third one. I think they're doing it in October. It's, it was always supposed to be June annually, but because these things get delayed and you can't get enough investors there, they do it in October. So you have to watch which ensembles are sent, and North Korea does reach out, and they do engage when it comes to performing arts. Um, and this even, it, it connects to this ensemble. They sent a very important ensemble. That's very important from the leadership standpoint's perspective. Last year to the trade fair. So to me, that's okay. At least there's a little bit of care being taken here by the North Koreans to, to kind of salve over the, the other difficulties. Um, and I think cultural diplomacy, we're at, we, we, we miss that at our peril. So I, I applaud you for that study. Um, I can't really, I have read the Jung Chin Sung book. Um, I think, you know, your guess is as good as mine. As 
to who's in charge. Uh, uh, but do keep in mind that his entire interpretation of uh, re- total reinterpretation of the 1980s is based on about four pages of kind of anecdata about something that he's having a flashback of once he gets to Manchuria. So great. I've been told by New Focus that they have documents that, that somehow buttress all of this in Seoul and that I can go look at them. Um, but if it's a recollection, and unless you're bringing documents over, um, I'd like to see more, I would just like to see more um, pulp or more, uh, more, I just need to see more there as a historian. Um, I can't, I, I can't reinterpret North Korean history without uh, documents. And I would also add as a historian, I can remember documents specifically that I've looked at in German archives about uh, North Korean Chinese relations, the North Koreans during Tiananmen Square. That's five years ago now, but I could tell you about specific documents. He hasn't done that uh, in the case of this history project supposedly he was working on. Um, so I'm not, I don't really have, uh, I don't have so much to say, I guess, uh, about the about the OGD. Uh, yes, right over the front. Is it working? Okay. Um, Kayla Foster from the University of Southern California. Thank you very much for your talk. Um, my question is, usually whenever things get a little rough in New, uh, North Korea when it comes to nuclear things and the U.S. gets upset and we try to kind of rally the international community around, we kind of look to China. Um, but from your talk, and a lot of that influence is supposedly coming from the economic sector, um, but your talk make it sounds like the Chinese have a lot more struggles in that sector than they, the international community really realizes. So my question is, do you think we can really look to China to have that influence and leverage over North Korea in other matters um, or not? I think in some ways your question is a good question, obviously, and it's the, it's the $64,000 question in Washington, largely, isn't it? Um, if if new, nonproliferation is the goal and sanctions enforcement gets us to nonproliferation, then uh, we have to ask what's going on in the border region, how strictly are, is the, the Chinese state and the, and the Chinese provinces and the Chinese frontier police, et cetera, um, and the commerce ministry, all these ministries that are involved. I mean, Nathan, who's sitting right next to you, has written a lot about this kind of institutional competition in Beijing and, and who's allowing what in and out. Um, I mentioned those trucks, right, that uh, showed up in the, in the parade in, I think, the April parade of 2012. Um, those aren't going over the bridge at Dandong. Those are going over at Jian, right? Those are going from Jian into Manpo, right? And you don't have photographers there. People aren't watching that bridge consistently. So who's in charge of that border juncture? Which PLA units? You know, you talk about the 39th Military Division on the PLA side. Um, which PLA generals have a deal with the KPA? Um, it's a wonderful article, which I recommend to everybody if once you have time to learn German and spend a whole summer in Berlin um, by a wonderful scholar named Stefan Blanke, and it's called Blut ist dicker als Wasser, okay? Blood is thicker than water, and it's all about the KPA's relationship with the PLA. So when you get down to that level, yes, we can talk about China enforcing, but what's the PLA doing? One of the encouraging things is that on the, on the propaganda You've got former PLA generals who are now bellyaching in public, right? Sidney Zeiler recently talked about that in a talk he gave with AEI um, about uh, th- using one of our translations, in fact, um, to talk about the uh, PLA complaining, basically, about nonproliferation, uh, talking about nuclear accidents in the border region. Um, my view, and this is not a very popular view, um, is that China's doing a fair amount, and I think given, the, again, the historical context of this relationship, I think they're going pretty far in the direction of intimidating North Korea, sanctions enforcement. There was a, the Commerce Ministry, and again, even if you read Chinese, these documents are hell. Okay, A 236-page document about tech sanctions enforcement along the border and which software is allowed in and is not allowed in, people like Roger Cavazos at Nautilus have kind of gone through the whole thing. right? That's like a patent lawyer has to do. You better, you better sit down and, and have a long time to do that sort of thing. Um, and China was quite serious about it, I think. So um, there's a lot happening behind the scenes. I think that when it comes to China, you have to look at what institution is doing what. And again, the provincial uh, connection is a very important one. right? Which border crossings is this stuff happening at? Where is this stuff getting across? Um, and then corruption as well. I mean, there's that whole, and again, the Stefan Blanca article that I mentioned talks about that, kind of official corruption. Um, Chosun Exchange had a great thing. Maybe if you get rid of corruption, it's a bad thing. Um, so these are all things to kind of take into account. Yeah, we had a question in the back. Yes, all in the back. 
Thank, thank you. Uh, Yang Ho Kim with Voice of America. Um, one quick question about the Gyeongje Gebalgu Economic uh, Development uh, Zones that North Korea uh, announced uh, late the last year. I heard that, that there's nothing much going on in that area designated as Gyeongje Gebalgu. And uh, I was wondering to what extent uh, China is, do you think China is willing to support that Gyeongje uh, Gebalgu idea? And from North Korea's point of view, to what extent are they seeking uh, support from China? Are they uh, probably uh, uh, seeking um, support or investment from other countries? Well, will that be successful? Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, that's, yeah, a very important question. I mean, in a way, that's um, in terms of if these new zones are going to succeed, I think that's very important. I haven't looked at the guest list of these new uh, economic development zone seminars that have been happening in Pyongyang. And I, again, I haven't, uh, you could do it as well as I could contact the colleague in Vancouver uh, who's working on all of this and who has been kind of uh, elevated in terms of the North Korean media as an expert, you know, a real foreign expert giving advice about how these economic development zones work. How many Chinese are participating in those meetings? I haven't seen much. The Chinese embassy, right, very important kind of locus for Chinese, uh, Chinese, uh, Chinese economic advice and Chinese economic investment uh, hasn't been saying much. The one good thing, and I will come back to my, let's see, where, I've got my secret slide here. Where did he go? Kim Song Nam is still involved, okay? And very close to Jiang Song Tech. He went with Jiang Song Tech on these various trips. He's fluent in Chinese. I recently found him interpreting Chinese for Kim Jong il and Peng Zhen, Peng Zhen in 1983. You know, this is an old friend of China, a very, very clever guy. Uh, Nicholas Levi, who's in Poland, uh, writes a lot about him. Um, he's still around and still involved. So these, these kind of lower, second tier interlocutors are still there. And I think there's so much other stuff to talk about right now. They have to kind of, if they have a bilateral, um, the, and, and when Jiang Tech was in China in 2012, they, there's things about the Xi'an case that are still unresolved. They had a 12 hour kind of closed door meeting um, about this kind of stuff, uh, people in Jiang's uh, delegation. And so there's so much legacy, there, there, logistical problems that, that, that have not been resolved prior to the Jiang execution, right? So there's a lot to talk about. These people are still around. Um, you can see I'm avoiding your question. Uh, <laughs> the, the answer to your question uh, is that I think it's going to be very difficult to get Chinese investors uh, in those zones uh, because the old zones had a much better setup. The whole point of setting up Chinese leases over Huangumpun Island and Huihua is that you can, you can get investors because they're protected. Um, regard, even if the Xi'an thing just keeps burbling on and is unresolved, too bad for the biggest investment prior, right? Too bad for those capitals who need to spend a couple months uh, in, in the hotels of Pyongyang trying to recoup their investment. Uh, I think that it's possible to get more investment, um, but maybe they're not set up to attract Chinese investment, which is the problem, right? You've got all, all the investments set up. It's waiting there. The trade fairs are happening. The Chinese set up trade fairs that no, no North Koreans participated in in 2012 to pump this up, right? To say, we're looking for investors, foreign investors, we're looking for Chinese investors. Um, and if North Korea is gonna simply move the goalposts and say, all the old stuff kinda doesn't matter, we've got this new thing, look at how much we love about economic development zones. To me, it's maybe the purpose is not to get Chinese investment. The whole point is to keep everybody off balance, but then to keep this idea going forward that we're still working on economic opening and reform. You know, Kim Jong-un, once he gets the right people out of the way, is going to emerge as the new Deng Xiaoping, right? But last time I checked, Kim Jong-un didn't open a bean curd uh, stand in Paris in the 1920s, nor did he give a long speech about a special economic zone, nor has he traveled to the special economic zones. When he does go to the border, it's to pay homage to statues, right? Um, and so I think that this gets in the way. What is North Korea spending money on in the, in the provinces? It's gonna be a very, very difficult. Watch the North Korean news, the nightly news, which you can watch on YouTube. It takes about a month sometimes to come out. But they're, they're talking about setting up twin statues now, right? Setting up a Kim Jong-il statue in every city, right? Chongjin, et cetera. And Cho if Chongjin, if that's a true decree, and Chongjin doesn't have that statue, they're gonna put the money into that statue first, right? And 
I think that that's, uh, there's still a lot of single statues all around the north and the northeast of Korea. Uh, and if that's the priority, uh, I don't think that you're going to see uh, a lot of Chinese investment uh, in these economic development zones. So kind of a, I could kind of rant on, um, but uh, you're, you've clearly pushed a very important button. I mean, I think this is, that's, that's the key question is, what about Chinese investors? What are they going to do that is cooperative is tourism, right? But again, tourism can be done away with tomorrow. It's very, very easy. Oh, can Chinese uh, capitalists have their phones in any of these, right? There's such basic stuff. Do they have electricity in any of these zones? Do you have a sewer in any of these zones? Largely not. Right, uh, and th those are those are really really key questions. And the Chinese are there; they're ready to develop tomorrow. They're ready to put a high speed train into Hunchun, right, and on to Raslan. I mean, they're they're ready to rock and roll. I mean, China's, you know, they've got a plan. It's moving forward. If you can't get that money, then you're trying not to get that money. Uh, Professor Wayne Glass from. University of Southern California. Uh, Nicholas, nice to see you again. Um, the question that's not exactly uh, right on the topic, but related in your last comment, could you give us, and I'm no expert in this area, so I'm just sort of curious, what's your, what's your view of the current relationship between China and North Korea with respect to energy supplies? Mm. I just had a meeting at Chatham House about a month ago um, with some people who are connected to this. And the beautiful thing about Chatham House is your memory can be terrible about what happened because you're not allowed to quote them. So I can't quote them, couldn't even tell you their names. But some really significant people who have good relationships with North Korea um, uh, are really excited about some of these pipeline projects, but it's mainly the stuff that goes through Russia, right? Russia's the, the important third player. I also think that that's why Rasson is such a key hub for North Korea because that's the one place they can legitimately kind of balance Russia and China to an extent, yeah? And, uh, and you can't do that in Sinwiju. Um, I don't know that much about the pipeline. You'll frequently hear stories about, you know, the Chinese are cleaning the pipeline or the oil's been cut off. I have no unique information there. I haven't spent enough time on the Chinese side of the border near Dandong to speak to the technicians. I mean, talk to taxi drivers. You could do the Tom Friedman method, um, speaking to a local in the region. Um, I think that, uh, you know, the huge Chinese oil well, one of the biggest suppliers of the domestic, I mean, China's still getting something like 40% of its entire domestic supply of oil from the Daqing oil wells, right, which is in Heilongjiang. Um, that's not all that far from North Korea. Um, could go there and talk to people. Um, I won't blather on too much, but I, I think energy is very important. Capacity really matters, though, right? Um, how much energy, and when you go up to the Rasslin area, you can see the, the, the electronic lines looping over across the border. Um, you don't really see that in the Yalu River uh, area because the Yalu's too wide and China does, there's a huge dam that they, they use cooperatively. Hydropower is very, very important uh, in, the, in the shared border region. And also this whole green thing uh, around, the, uh, around uh, Mount Pektu. China's got this whole new green consciousness. Kim Jong-un is kind of on about it pretty regularly. I think he's legit. I think he cares. I think that it's not just all propaganda about saying we need to be more sustainable with energy. Um, we want to sell our carbon credits, that sort of thing. So if you have like a new, what do they call it? Eco-Maoism, right? Kind of the, if we have a new kind of eco-Maoism flowing across the border, then great, you know, go for it. Be socialist, keep your social system. Nobody's on to destroy it. Um, but if you want to share uh, hydropower, solar power, uh, whatever, whatever they set up. China is really worried, though, about the nuclear power plants uh, in North Korea. And, you know, they're very, very, and that comes into Chinese consciousness very, very strongly. Um, and the people in the border region know it. You know, where they're having drills, they're having, ant, you know, nuclear accident drills up on the Chinese-North Korean border. Um, and that's this kind of the Fukushima-ization uh, the potential for a Fukushima-like accident plays a really important role um, in terms of China's um, perceptions of North Korea, the mass Chinese perceptions, uh, intelligent, informed opinion, which is a lot of people uh, in China. I think, I think Chinese people in the border region in particular are pretty, pretty clever um, and pretty keyed into all these questions. But if, if North Korea um, is basically saying, uh, let us have our nuclear program because it solves the energy question, the Byungjin line, right? Is Byungjin an energy policy? Not last time I checked. Um, so, but they complain that the Chinese are pushing them on that line as well. Anyway, I'm, I'm going around round and round about in circles around your question, but I think it's a really important element and something I'm going to try to learn more about. Hi. Uh, 
Brad Harris, HRNK. Mm -hmm. um, I'm in uh, 2012, or in the last few years, I've heard a, a lot about um, North Korean workers uh, in uh, ch working in China, mm -hmm. and there's been uh, I heard reports in 2012 of agreements of uh, as much as 120,000 North Korean workers. Uh, I wonder if you could talk a little bit about how that's developed and does that impact the special econ economic zones at all? Is there a connection? Or? Yeah, that's, that's actually a part of a bigger question about North Koreans legally in China. And um, I spent April 15th at the uh, UN Middle School in Jilin which is the biggest party that North Koreans have each year outside of the DPRK to celebrate the birth of their leader. Um, and, uh, well, how I got there, cannot, it's like Jung Jin-sung, it cannot be disclosed. Uh, someday it will be revealed uh, how I got into this meeting. Um, but it was an active meeting. There were so many North Koreans there. Um, there's a lot of money. There are North Korean kids living in China. This is post-purge, mind you, right? This is five months after the fact. So the North Korean business community in China is not some sclerotic, uh, falling apart, disheartened, uh, you know, they're all going to come back to be beaten down and thrown in the gulag, right? There are a lot of people there making money, and they're still there, and the money is needed, and the remittances are needed, etc. So I think overall, my assessment of that, based largely on anecdote and going to a lot of these restaurants, there's a lot of new ones coming up. It's fairly robust in terms of um, people who are living in China. I spent a week at the, uh, what is that? Uh, it's the hotel in, uh, anybody remember the name? Shenyang? The North Korean hotel in Shenyang? Oh boy, I'm getting old, I can't remember this. But uh, spent, spent some time at that hotel. It's, a, it's, been, it's been upgraded, it's very nice. You know, you have some North Korean business people kind of living there. When I was in Dandong, I stayed at a, at a hotel um, full of North Koreans. Um, that were there kind of as a large group. So there's a lot of movement back and across, across the border. As far as that actual, those large numbers though, systematic, I think they've, they've, that's, <laughs> that's part of the problem with the SEZ question, right? Because you're supposed to have North Korean workers in all these factories. Well, the factories haven't been set up. Nobody's been moved. There's no capacity there for them. So where is the capacity? It's in China, right? It's in Hunchun. So watch Hunchun, watch Dandong. Um, I have not gone to Hunchun to talk to people at these factories. As far as I know, they don't have 10,000 workers there making t-shirts, right? Um, and so the, the, question about, um, the question about large numbers of North Korean workers coming in, I think it's, it's, it's both connected to and separate from uh, the SEZ question. Um, I'll be in Hunchun in, I think, September or August, um, and I can let you know uh, by email what I find. Uh, if I know anything, I'll give it to Stefan Haggard as well. So um, he's... Uh, yeah, he's, he's usually pretty interested in that stuff. I, 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 incidentally, I should apologize for not citing his work all over this paper um, because uh, very, very, obviously extremely relevant. Um, and I think that uh, Marcus Nolan and, and those uh, types of analysts, I think, are probably a better source than I am in terms of to what extent this is, this is moving forward. But if I get some actual confirmation, you don't see that many North Korean truck drivers in China. Um, you see them getting their trucks fixed. Um, and you... You just don't get the sense that, there's, that we're on the cusp of this going through these 10,000 workers here and there. But China's ready to make it happen again. I mean, they're, they're, they're happy to, to set up those factories and have that cheap labor um, like Russia has got already, right? Cheap North Korean labor. Hi, I'm Yongchen Kim, uh, HRNK as well, and then I go to Fletcher School. Mm -hmm. My question is here, uh, can you tell us more about Russia's engagement in economic cooperation with DPRK and possible engagement, their possible engagement in the uh, eco economic, uh, special economic zone projects? Because I, I, yesterday, I, beside the energy project, because yesterday, uh, Noh Dong Shimon actually mentioned about Russia's plan about a uh, uh, new economic zone in Vladivostok. And they they mentioned about it with their great interest, and then also you mentioned their North Korea's trade minister Yi Yong Nam visited Vladivostok this month, and then they talked about uh, building a bridge between Russia and, and North Korea. And can this be a cha game changer, like on this dynamics between China, China, North Korea, and Russia, or can this affect? Uh, relations between North Korea and China economic job. Yeah, I would normally say I have no idea. Um, but fortunately, I went to a conference at Cambridge on this question last month, and so I can channel expertise of other people who, who I spoke with about this question. Um, they're not very bullish, um, the experts at Cambridge, the people who are really, really looking at Russia in the Far East very, very closely. Um, they're not bullish. 
Um, there are a lot of infrastructural problems. Nadoka, I think is the name of the city. There's a, a North Korean consulate there. It's a closer to DPRK. There's more of a history. Vladivostok is a little further away. Um, my colleagues at Sino NK, Darcy Drought is here, um, who was just at a big Borderlands conference in Russia, can, maybe has a better answer than I do. Um, I think that the, um, I think that when it comes down to it, again, are we talking about a new project when the old project is still there? The infrastructure, the Greater Tumen Initiative, there are conferences every, every October. There's a big conference. If you have the time to go to Yenbian, um, Yenji, uh, Yenbian University helps to set it up. There's like a major, major conference every October. There are DPRK academics who go. There are Russians. They do talk. Um, my understanding is that that's mostly on paper. Um, but you can't ignore the fact, you know, little things like... Uh, when the, when the, the Russian embas, uh, ambassador gets, a, gets, you know, he's talking to important people in Pyongyang. Um, now, is, is anything functional happening at those parties? Um, the Chinese ambassador doesn't get that kind of face time with uh, Yang hyung Sop and some of those other kind of senior leaders um, who know China pretty well. Um, that's about the best I can do. I'll, I'll continue to watch it. Rob Warren, I'd like to ask you to step back for a second. Mm -hmm. You've given a, an excellent presentation of the SEZ problem along the border, but what does this mean? I, I draw from that that there's a lot of mismanagement on the side of the North Koreans. Uh, their biggest asset would be cooperating with China, obviously, in investment and other activities, and that hasn't gone well at all. What does this, what does this spell for the North Korean economy? Mm. Will they continue to dither away what assets they have? Yeah. Well, I think if you look at the mining is a big question, right? Uh, and we've seen a lot of talk about that in South Korea when we talk about the bonanza or the, the jackpot that could result as a result of unif reunification. Um, if you look at the mining sector, um, there's still some pretty strong relationships there, even though the Xiyang uh, case put a damper on those. Um, if you go to the two men border crossing, there's still large uh, loads of coal coming out of North Korea. Um, it's slightly lower sulfur than the stuff you can get in China, so it's slightly less bad for the air, um, which is not that great in Jilin province to begin with. Um, but I think the mining sector is, is certainly one to watch, um, and I think it's maybe not as doom and gloom as I've, as I've, as I've stated. Um, the question of yuanization in North Korea is one to watch. Um, and I think that's one of the things that in some ways is slowing this down. I think North Korea is the, the leadership or um, the people who matter in the DPRK who make policy um, are really ambivalent, right, about uh, the unionization of the North Korean economy, particularly the northern tier. And I think that's a barrier in some ways to uh, more special economic zones being set up or these EDZs actually working. Because they talk about there will be North Korean sovereignty exercised in these zones. Well, who's going to go in there and invest if you've got to do all your work in the North Korean won, right? Last time I checked, that was not a particularly safe currency, right, for any, for any investor to, to operate in. And so um, there are those very, very um, logistical questions that I think have to be answered. Um, as far as investment along the border, um, the, it's the big Chinese firms that matter, right? If you get big contracts with major firms that have connections to the central government in Beijing, um, so if it's mining, uh, manufacturing, again, using the cheap labor that we talked about uh, earlier, um, and those decisions are made in, in Shenyang, Changchun, uh, and Harbin, and I think that if you get big firms that are willing to take a risk uh, and go into North Korea, some of these problems can be solved. Um, but again, it's going to be primarily mining, um, all this small stuff. Again, tourism, it's just, these are little shoots. This is, these are little bubbles, right? As, as one Chinese uh, writer wrote about in the, in the uh, Shijie the, 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 the uh, very important edit, uh, magazine uh, published by the foreign ministry, said it could all be soap bubbles, right? These are just things like tourism very easily cut off. Um, and uh, so you, if you're taking that as a trend, I think that may be a mistake but it's about big contracts, big companies. One of the principles, I'll just conclude on this, um, one of the principles uh, that China has, has, has pushed in the SEZs, uh, in the Huang Gunpyun in particular, is that companies lead. It's not about the central government pushing companies in. So companies are going to take the lead. And I think that they're basically being true to that. Um, and so it's a question of, uh, you know, Chinese minerals firms have got interests all over the world. Um, 
but I think they're always going to be interested in DPRK, and if the conditions are right, they'll, they'd be happy to go in. Whether or not these economic development zones along the border have anything to do with that is, is another question entirely. Do you have any feel for the um, number of defectors from the overseas workforce? Um, or are enough family members held hostage um, back in North Korea that that's just not a problem? Yeah, that's an important question. Um, my sense, again, just from being there when I'm there, I, I, I think it's, uh, we had one defection case or uh, right in Cambodia, I guess. One of these waitresses ran off with a, a South Korean guy. Um, and that was, that's big. That's, that's a bombshell uh, in the context of Cambodia. I think in the Northeast, um, m everybody's there to follow the rules. Um, they're making money. It's not that much. Um, but my sense of, uh, is that you're not, you don't have a lot of people running off. I'll tell you the extent, this is an anecdote, right, which may or may not be useful. Um, I spent two days at a North Korean restaurant with somebody who had a photograph of themselves with Kim Jong-un, right? I was with, as Jiang Jin Sung would call him, one of the anointed, okay, with a capital A. Uh, that means somebody who has spent a lot of time with Kim Jong-un and, um, you know, has the photos to prove it. You know, we've sat around and smoked cigars together and drank vodka. You can guess at what event. And uh, one about physical fitness. Um, and I think that... Uh, so that really helped a lot. Uh, so I spent a lot of time with these North Koreans. They took a lot of photos with us. They were very interested. They all had their Samsung cameras, which was great. I felt very patriotic. And, and the whole thing about that was I went back uh, two days later, and I decided to bring them some information from the outside because we had hit it off so well. And uh, it was a copy of a journal article from the Kim Il-sung University Journal, which I got at Yenbyon Univers uh, Yen University Library. It's a great journal. I made photocopies of one of those articles, and um, it was, I can send you the whole description. I've written this up, but uh, I haven't published it anywhere. But uh, to make a long story short, they refused to take it. They would not take this information because it could potentially corrupt them, right, because it came from a foreigner. And it's Kim Il-sung University Journal, right? They're not going to take it. They're not going to go near that. Uh, they refused to take a pamphlet written by Kim Jong-un, published by Kim Jong-un in Chinese, Right, it's just like we're not we're not going there. This is this is not a good idea. Um, so they're happy to play music with you and and to chat with you about all kinds of stuff, but um, they're not going to put themselves in that kind of danger. My so my anecdotal sense is that um, you don't have a lot of people who are ready to defect. Also, China is going to cooperate 100 percent. Right, they made that very clear in their response to the Commission of Inquiry. Right, they will hunt those people down. There's. I, I'm not sure what's happening in Russia with the loggers, right? Those kind of people escaping that. But in China, it's much easier to, to get out, blend in, go into the city. Um, when you buy a train ticket, they need your passport now, right? You get on a bus, there's going to be a police officer get on the bus, and it comes and goes, right? There are times when you can get on a, a, a regional bus without uh, showing identification. But my sense of security is pretty good. There's a lot of cooperation between North Korea and China um, in, in kind of the refoulement of the, of the defectors, et cetera, right? So it's, uh, it's, a, it's not a, although the North Koreans themselves frequently depict Manchuria as this like land of wildebeests where you will be devoured by capitalist scum, you know, right? It's rife with agents and people helping to defect. And I think it's quite the opposite. It's really hard to find anybody to help you out uh, if you're a North Korean defector who's trying to, trying to get out of there. And, and while, Barbara Demick's book has been published in Chinese, right? Some of these defector memoirs are making their way into, uh, into China. People are talking about the gulag in a way that they never had before. Lao Gai, Lao Gai reform in China. You know, we're, we've, we've got it over these North Koreans because life here is better in those prison camps. I mean, there's an awareness there that's great in China. It's growing, but that does not mean that people are going to step over the boundary into breaking the law and helping those defectors, um, you know, find their way out and, and back into the ROK or wherever they find asylum. Hi, Scott Snyder, Council on Foreign Relations. Um, you had a great picture of Kim Jong-un there with uh, Li Keqiang. Uh, but of course, in the next uh, couple of weeks, we're going to be, be seeing Xi Jinping spending time with Pak Geun Hye. Mm. Uh, and it seems like the high-level China-North Korea relationship is kind of stalled out. Uh, so I just want to ask you to speculate. What do you think is the next move uh, in the China-North Korea relationship? Or... Is it so toxic post Jiang Song Tak that nobody, including Kim Jong Un, can own it? Hmm. Yeah, that's a huge question. Um, 
while I subconsciously get my brain around that, I will mention that I think the, the ROK-China relationship under Park Geun-hye is really blossoming, and that's part of the problem for the North Koreans, right? It's that if, if Kim Jong-un is meeting with the Chinese, are you meeting with these people who are betraying you already and who have already gone over to kind of the ROK model of reunification, um, who are basically setting up all this stuff along the border so that they can make deals with Chaebol and kind of, you know, basically squeeze North Korea that way. Um, and don't underestimate how deep that goes. I think Park Geun-hye has uh, been extremely skillful in reappropriating history, right? So we talked about legacy, and you obviously know that I believe in that. I think that's a very important element. There, China is now publicly talking about kind of the anti-Japanese movement in the 1930s in a way that has nothing to do with the Kim family. That's terrifying from a North Korean perspective. You're suddenly talking about the exile government in Shanghai. Um, you're talking about uh, the people who were purged in the 1950s uh, from, uh, from the Yan'an faction, right? I mean, those are, whoa, those are very sensitive spots um, for the North Koreans. Um, I, I spent some time in Harbin and went to the Ang Chung Gun Museum. Um, big success, right? I mean, smart move by Park Gun Hye. Going to Xi'an, talking about Chinese soft power, smart. You know, Chinese people, she's very popular. Her memoirs everywhere when you go to Chinese state bookstores. You can, you can, buy, you can buy books about Park Gun Hye and people are excited. Um, I think that, you know, unless we're reading tea leaves um, improperly, um, my understanding is that, uh, you know, Kim Jong-un and the North Korean state is kind of, I think they're ambivalent about meeting, meeting anybody uh, from China, aren't they? Uh, when Kim Jong-un uh, meets Chinese leaders who come since he's come into power, um, he's meeting along with Kim Gye-gwan, right, who's kind of there. One meeting that uh, one of the uh, international liaison division went to, uh, they had dinner with Kim Jong-un, and Kim Jong-un was seen being very manly and assertive, and kind of, there was a lot of this going on, and, you know, kind of, uh, right, gesticulating, and he was just like, you know, what are you talking about? Is this, are you praising the wine? Um, but, you know, he was really enthused and excited, and he gave a big hug, etc. And then the next time when Kim gye Gwan was there, and they had been sort of rebuked, and this talk about, you've got to get back to six-party talks, the gift that they brought him was a little six, real cheap airport six, you know, six teacups, his little tea set. You know, and Kim Jong-un sort of like, yeah, this is praising me, thank you. You know, this is majorly insulting. And, um, and then he, he kind of calmed down at the next meeting, right? I mean, he kind of, he was very sort of, made very few gestures. And so I think that, and then they did this uh, other tea leaf reading, right? You know, they did the airport thing where he went to the air show with Kim Ki Nam and kind of this whole orchestrated thing, the red carpet stuff. Does that mean he wants to go to Beijing? They've been monkeying around with this since 2009, I met academics in Beijing who, uh, before Kim Jong-un's photo came out, who said he came to China and he met the, North, he met the Chinese leaders and the Chinese leaders were impressed. You know, like Zhang Jinsong, I'll believe it when I see it, right? It's, it's, I, I, great. That's a really interesting anecdote. Um, I found stuff in Chinese economic journals that say he went to a high-tech factory in Zhejiang, right? He's gone to Zhejiang and looked around, maybe in 2010, with his dad. I have no idea. But... Um, he could be doing a lot more and the North Koreans could be doing a lot more to kind of, kind of tamp this thing down and do this, do this stuff. It's small ball, right? Is North Korea doing the small ball? Are they sending cultural delegations? Are you doing an opera that like says something nice about China like they did in 2010 and 2011? Are you publishing stuff about Manchuria that makes it sound like not a land of hobgoblins and monsters, right? And none of that stuff is happening. So, and that's what I can document, right? And I can document talking with Chinese academics, which you do all the time. I mean, this is, it's... The question of, is Kim Jong-un going to meet Xi Jinping? It's going to be a while. Um, and I think that... Uh, I recently, recently read an article. I had a few articles sent to me for a journal that I review for, and it talked about the great relationship between uh, the Kim family and China. And I don't think Kim Jong-un gets it. I don't think that they're doing the small stuff. Um, I don't think there are enough of these small delegations going back and forth. Um, and so that, it's a really bad answer that I have. I don't have the answer. Um, I think Nathan might know what you know, some Chinese academics are saying more than I do um, in terms of you know, are, is, are the people around Xi Jinping uh, at all confident that Kim Jong-un could come to China and, and not be a total fiasco uh, for the Chinese state. But Park Geun-hye has been smart. I mean, this relationship is getting better and better. 
And of course, it goes back to the 1980s, right? I mean, those Shandong, Liaoning, the ROK's business strategy, it's been great. So uh, uh, Nicholas and I talked about what is the ROK kind of, what are the moves? And they're making all the right moves and they've been making the right moves. Um, and uh, I think once North Korea gets it all sorted out, you know, we'll, we'll find out, right? Uh, if the Chinese are willing to meet them or not, or are there conditions in place, right? Do they have to agree to come back to the six-party talks? Um, I think you were there, in fact, in, at the fake six-party conference, right? Or the, I don't know what we call it. It was a, a dress rehearsal for the reconvening of the six-party talks. And, I mean, you, you know, I, I'm not sure how encouraging that whole exercise was, you know, as to where the relationship is going and, and if China's willing to walk away from any of this stuff. Uh, I think they hate the Byungjin line. I think they're... They're fed up. Yes. Thanks. Uh, Nathan Bolshaw from the U.S. China Commission. So you've talked a lot about um, Chinese efforts to encourage reform in North Korea and all these attempts to kind of jumpstart this economic relationship. But it really seems that North Korea hasn't yet signed the dotted line. You know, they've gone very close a couple times, but really haven't gone over the edge of the point of no return. So is there a possibility that North Korea will eventually just miss the boat? Will China ever give up on this dream of economic cooperation with North Korea? Or is this economic possibility just so alluring to China or just so strategically, uh, even security-wise, necessary along a SIPRI line of denuclearization that China, despite all these troubles, can never abandon the dream of cooperation with North Korea? So is there a point where China just says, I give up, I leave? Hmm. Yeah, that's, an, that's sort of the Chinese dream, isn't it? That it's Our dream is your dream, as one Chinese diplomat told me in Nottingham. Um, but I think that uh, there is what, that element of, uh, yeah, maybe we can get them to do what we want. Maybe everybody can make more money. The difference is that um, if you remember back in 2000 and 2001, those, uh, you know, there were big protests in Liaoyang, and I was actually spending time there in, in Liaoning province. These workers stood up. Tonghua had a big riot. A manager got killed in 2009. They beat him to death, you know, because they took their pensions and ran away. But I don't think China's that nervous now about, like, big uprisings among unemployed workers. The Tiafan Wan or the Iron Rice Bowl being smashed, that's a fait accompli, right? So I don't think that China's so worried about... Um, I was in Dalian as well during a protest about a... a, a um, what was that big spill? You know, they spilled these horrible toxins into the river, environmental protests... Um, so as long as North Korea doesn't have a huge nuclear accident, um, it can be managed. And I think the dream is, yes, to have a really burgeoning trade in that border region. They've set up the infrastructure to do so. It's really impressive. Even Tumen, which is a little out of the way place, has got a big new government building right across the bridge. Um, it's really good for them. Um, the high-speed train is coming in, as I said. But I think that the... Um, is China willing to give up its dream for North Korea? I think... Are they willing to abandon North Korea? That's where the history comes into play. And the whole Mao legacy and all the debate that's gone on. There have been some little journal articles about reevaluating the meaning of the Korean War, right? And that is not just for people with PhDs in history, right? This is not small stuff. This is major. Changing what they call the Korean War, uh, talking about North Korea having unleashed the Korean War, the Baofa, right? The North Korea is the instrument of Baofa, right? They are the ones who started the Korean War. That's now changed in China. There's a much more open discussion about that, um, which opens the way to critiquing Mao's decision to support North Korea in the first place. So is that the original sin that you're trying to redo, right? North China's s saving of the DPRK in October 1950, when it was occupied by, you know, talk about rollback, you had South Korean, you know, officials getting ready to basically run the whole thing. You had... Paik sung Yop and others in Pyongyang in October 1950. You know, they're collecting all those captured documents that we can have fun looking at in the National Archives. I mean, that, the destruction of the DPRK and China saved it. And so when they're relitigating that, um, I think it's important, but it's just a sign. I think they're not ready to, to undo it. If you read the, the Mao, uh, Mao Zedong Nianpu, right, the new uh, six volumes of Mao's, uh, uh, Mao's papers, new stuff uh, that was published in December, Tons and tons and tons of interest in Korea. China's interest in North Korea. I don't think they're going to abandon it. And um, I've got some work that I've been with Chuck Krauss on this. I mean, this relationship is much stronger than we think. Um, 
and particularly when it goes back to the 40s and 50s. I, I think to think that China's just going to, yes, things are happening with Park Good Hay. Yes, she's making the right moves. The ROK is doing what it needs to do, but it's a long-term game. Uh, to think that China's going to move some troops around the border region and kind of intimidate everyone into thinking that it's happening. Um, you know, uh, scholars like Jennifer Lind, uh, Sumi, Terry, you know, keep writing, keep looking at it. Bruce Bennett, do your thing, you know. I love to read those reports, but uh, it's, uh, I don't think it's happening anytime soon. And uh, I don't think they're, the other thing is cultural. Uh, yes, they're bad. Yes, Kim Jong-un is silly. Yes, he gesticulates and is annoying. But uh, the fact is, they've got a, you know, the young pioneers, right? They've got, you've got your little East Germany right there, you know, and perfectly, con you know, crystallized socialism, youth leagues. I've, I'm shocked at how much praise I hear, uh, not just in Xinhua, but from talking to Chinese people about, you know, North, North Korean kids are real healthy, you know, they exercise, they swim, they're happy, they follow the rules. We wish our kids could be more like that. Wow. Okay, you know. Uh, they've got a great music education system. You know, look at the kids who can play the piano so quickly. And, you know, it's impressive. The Moranbong Band, who, by the way, traveled to uh, China with Jiang Song Tech. So if you want, I've got all kinds of data on that. Very, very interesting. You know, is the Moranbong Band a cipher for reform? You know, yeah, kind of. Um, they're also controlled by an 85-year-old man uh, who happened to study in Moscow and for whom Moscow 1960 is super liberal. You know, North Korea is not moving in that direction, but China doesn't need them to. Look at Mao's response to the Hungarian uprising in the 50s, right? China's a fundamentally conservative place when it comes to political reform. And I think they sort of like the fact that they can both point at North Korea as being aberrant, but yet somewhat like them. Um, and I think that that's hard for us to get our brains around sometime, that they're not just pure pariah, purely other. Sometimes, um, even in 1989, right, which one of these countries is going to fall first? I mean, man, I've been in the East German archives reading this, like North Koreans talking to German counterparts, like, yeah, we think the Chinese are going to pull it out. You know, we think they're going to, it's going to be stable there. You know, we believe in our Chinese comrades. You know, we have no problems, right? Uh, so purges, instability and in leadership, which one of these places falls? I think the North Koreans are pretty confident they can keep it going. Um, and uh, I think the Chinese are, they don't, they don't want to throw this thing out. Netizen comments, whatever, right? They'll, they'll oh, the, North Korea is going to turn into Vietnam. Okay, sure. Last question. Hi, uh, Ian Beck from the University of Southern California. Hmm. Um, just regarding what you said about the nuclear power plants along the Chinese-North Korean border and the tensions that have recently come in um, in your paper about the economic benefits of China to move into North Korea, do you think this will possibly Yeah, I think that's the, to kind of link your question with Nathan's, that's the game changer, right? And that's the, the new escape hatch that they have, essentially is we can go in and intervene and do what needs to be done, you know, whatever that it means, you know, breaking off, you know, a province or two, um, if there's a nuclear accident, right? If uh, we are going to be sufficiently threatened. Um, and I think that that's where the environmental awareness, the Fukushima effect, actually is not to be scoffed at. And when you've got... You know, the sister paper of the Reminer Bao or the People's Daily, right? That's about as central as it gets. Uh, you've got a PLA general in there saying, you know, we'll do what we need to do um, if, if there's a nuclear accident. You know, this non-proliferation discussion that we have all the time in Washington that we've been having. Um, you know, I think that that's, um, that's where you could see a game changer in there sort of. But if you look at the past and how they responded to the death of Kim Jong-il, very stable. Right, very much like hands off North Korea, right? You know, and we've got your guys' back. We'll even talk about a nuclear umbrella uh, if you need to. We support the succession. The extent to which Chinese policy is fundamentally conservative when it comes to protecting North Korea, I think is, I think it's well established. Um, and so, but there are these little escape patches that are now popping up, and there are these very troubling signs about sort of reinterpreting sort of, you know, their historical relationship with North Korea. Um, that bears watching. So in some ways, just to kind of wrap a bow around this, the special economic zones are very important. It's been a, it's been a point of fracture and a point of friction. But it, the fact that this uh, Huang Gampion Island was kind of thrown in the bin, right? Made into, you know, it's, it's just rubbish, as the British like to say. Um, it's still there. It's still waiting. It can be developed when the North Koreans are ready. 
Um, and it doesn't mean that the entire relationship is, is, at a, is, at a, is at a breaking point. And Jang's death does not mean that it's at a breaking point. We talked about the second level people. They're still there. Things are moving forward. And China's waiting, ready to play the long game. It's like Joanne Lai said, you know, maybe it takes 100 years, 200 years. You know, the French Revolution, we don't know how we feel about it yet. It takes time. And uh, maybe the Chinese are going to continue talking about, you know, maybe 30 years from now we're still having this conversation about, oh, remember the early Kim Jong-un era when we kind of supported him and put all that money on the table? Well, you know, we're still here. We're doing our thing. You know, Dandong is still there. It's growing. Um, as long as North Korea doesn't, you know, start sinking Chinese ships... Um, or uh, you know, testing right next to the border. I think I think things are going to kind of keep. Uh, what's the phrase? The famous phrase of Eberstadt, muddling on. Yeah. Unfortunately, we're up on time. Uh, lots of great points and topics, of conversations, and questions raised. So please join me in thanking Dr. Adam Cathcart. Thanks, everyone.